So now having talked about how critical a clock network is and what kinds of non-idealities can impact it, we want to discuss how clock distribution networks should be designed. And to do that, we first have to define what metrics clock distribution networks have to satisfy. So of course, a clock distribution network has to ensure that the same clock signal reaches all registers. In other words, that's a coded way of saying we have to minimize skew. It also has to ensure that uh, there's as much, uh, that the clock signal has as little phase noise as possible, which means we are trying to reduce jitter. These are obvious things that the clock distribution network should be trying to do. But while doing that, the clock distribution network has to be uh, cognizant of a couple of things. First is power and area, and these are highly related issues. Because one way you can reduce uh, specifically skew uh, for clocks is to throw as much metal as you can at the clock distribution network. You know, uh, wider uh, wires used to distribute the, the clock are going to have low resistance and thus low skew. But um, th they are also going to have a large capacitance, which is going to lead to a large uh, amount of power dissipation, and it's going to occupy a very large area. The other thing we have to be careful about is um, how uh, tied the clock distribution network is to the underlying design, um, meaning um, how easy it is to uh, uh, um, reconfigure the clock distribution network. This will become clear when we talk about the different uh, options available to us, but if the clock distribution network is very specific to the underlying design, uh, that's going to make it very hard to change the underlying design. Because once you change the underlying design, you also have to change the clock distribution network. If the clock distribution network is agnostic to what lies beneath it, then when you change the underlying design, the clock distribution network can remain pretty much the same. And because the design flow is iterative, uh, there's a really good chance that you're going to have to uh, redesign some parts of your circuit. And so we can say that this is uh, agnosticism about uh, underlying design. So there's three ways in which there are three approaches, basically, uh, to clock distribution networks, grids, uh, trees, and hybrid, hybrid methods. So grids aim to increase agnosticism and reduce skew in absolute terms by throwing as much metal at the problem as possible. Uh, so they are very flexible in terms of how they can be applied. And on the other hand, they uh, consume a huge area and can thus be very power hungry. Trees, on the other hand, are hand tailored. They are very specific to the underlying design and they don't actually aim to reduce absolute skew, they aim to reduce relative skew, which is actually what we care about. Uh, but with, with, whereas they are very economic with metal and can be uh, very uh, power efficient and area efficient, they are tightly knit to the under, underlying design. The best and most effective clock distribution methods are hybrids that combine the two uh, to make use of both their advantages. So the first way we can distribute a clock network is we're using a grid. So this is a grid of metal wires, and we're gonna drive the clock signal through this metal grid. And uh, there are registers underneath the grid. Each register is gonna use the value of the clock that it sees. The idea here is that this grid is interconnected uh, providing low resistance path everywhere uh, and uh, thus we're going to reduce skew by reducing absolute resistance. Uh, there's going to be a maximum skew between uh, between uh, registers at this end of the, of the chip and registers at this end of the chip. Or if we talk about absolute skew relative to the original clock, then the absolute skew is maximum towards the end of the grid. But we can solve that by actually driving the uh, clock from all directions, which leads to maximum skew relative to the ideal clock near the center of the grid. And if you have a large ship, you can use multiple grids, each of which is driven in all four directions, leading to uh, a minimization of absolute skew everywhere. So 
A grid, again, aims to reduce absolute skew. It, it does is agnostic to the underlying design because you don't really care what the underlying design is. You are reducing skew to everybody equally. And the way you do it is to use a lot of metal, which leads to a lot of power dissipation and um, a lot of area consumption. This is typically going to occupy an entire metal layer. Now, the other approach, the opposite approach, basically, is the clock, uh, is the clock tree. So a clock tree is a tree of buffers, as is shown here. And uh, this tree of buffers is going to drive the clock signal to different nodes on the chip. And the aim here is not to minimize absolute skew. So we are not trying to minimize skew between every node on the chip. Instead, we are trying to minimize skew between nodes at the same level on the chip. And so skew between A and B, between registers at nodes A and B, is going to be small. Between C and D is going to be small. Between E and F is going to be small. And one of the most popular tree networks used to distribute uh, uh, clocks is the H3 network. So in the H3 network, you use buffers to drive and then you use an H structure, which is then used uh, in ever smaller H's with ever smaller buffers to drive the uh, clock signal to very specific registers so that a register here and a register here will have a significantly different delay from a register at this point, but they will have good delay relative to each other because registers that communicate with each other tend to have uh, tend to be close together, uh, this H network will guarantee good local skew, whereas not actually caring about absolute skew everywhere in the circuit. So this is obviously more area efficient and thus more power efficient than a grid, but it is completely tied to the underlying design. You have to know where the registers are so that you can deliver the signal to them with minimum skew. If you change the underlying design, you have to redesign your whole clock distribution network. So a practical clock distribution network is going to be a hybrid of multiple approaches. And this is a popular practical approach. Here, this is the clock source coming from the outside of the chip. It's going to be driven to a spine. The spine aims to do one thing. It aims to create a clock in the vertical direction on a metal wire in the vertical direction, which has minimum skew. So it's going to drive it through successive layers of buffers and it's going to do so with the intention of driving it with the minimum resistance possible so that we have a clock that is at zero skew in this vertical direction. We cannot then do the same in the horizontal direction because we will need an infinite number of spines. But we, what we can do is we can use these generated clocks to then drive H networks. And these H3 networks are going to drive the clock to specific areas of the chip. Now, when we reach an area of the chip, we can use a small grid to drive the clock to that area. Now, this allows us to combine several advantages. First, the grid is going to guarantee flexibility of redesign within this area. And if this area is a, uh, a functional unit that has meaning within the design, then you can actually make changes to that area without having to redesign the tree because the tree is only driving the clock to uh, different clock domains. And yet we are not using grids everywhere. And so we are actually saving a lot of metal and a lot of area and a lot of power.